story of the Great Gatsby today. Omnibus, now on BBC One, discovers how little America has changed. most important American novel of the 20th century. It's the great American novel. That elusive notion of the American dream has never seemed quite so uh, tangible as it is in the context of The Great Gatsby. It is filled with American themes, American ideas, American ideals, and the ways in which the American dream has rewarded its believers and betrayed its believers. That book takes over your mind, it takes over your heart. That book can make you think and think and think about this country, where we're going, where we came from. I worked for Scott Fitzgerald for the last 20 months of his life, from April 1939 through December 1940. During that time, I saw him almost daily, whenever he needed you, he needed you now. This feels so strange. It's been 60 years since I've been here. Uh, the last time was when Fitzgerald had died and was lying on the ground when I came. And I, I didn't know what had happened. I thought he had fainted. And Sheila was in the background sobbing. And I asked what happened. And she told me. Uh, that he was by the fireplace uh, and just keeled over. So it's very hard to, to come into this uh, freshly painted new place uh, where the old memories do linger, but they, they seem out of time altogether. When he died, there was practically no sale of his books, except by him. Uh, he would buy the books to give as gifts uh, to friends or to people who worked with him, who wanted them. And when he got a royalty statement at the end of a year, uh, he got a few pennies back because the royalties were on, uh, on the books that he had bought. So it is kind of ironic now that the sale has run into millions. The Great Gatsby is F. Scott Fitzgerald's masterpiece. This slim and seemingly insubstantial book about a young man with a dream has long been recognized as the greatest American novel of the 20th century. Yet Fitzgerald's tale of romantic longing is now reaching even greater heights of acclaim. Hailed as a novel for this century, rather than the last. The Great Gatsby now sells more copies every month in the United States than it sold during Fitzgerald's entire lifetime. It must be uh, up around a third of a million copies a year. And this is 75 years uh, after the thing uh, was originally published, April 1925. 
It shows no signs of tapering off. Well, I said a long time ago that it was a great American novel. It's only 55,000 words long. That's a real feat to put that much of a story in that few words. And then I've been trying all my life to compress things like that. The Great Gatsby captures, like no other novel, the reckless pleasure-seeking and exuberance of 1920s America at the height of economic boom, a period Fitzgerald famously christened the Jazz Age. There was prohibition, uh, which caused a lot more drinking than, than might have happened if there hadn't been prohibition. So there was an enormous amount of drunkenness, an uh, enormous amount of carousing, an uh, enormous amount of surreptitious sex. And he captured that. Uh, that, that was one of his, uh, his, his enormous gifts, was his ability to, to smell the, uh, the excitement of that period. The sky wasn't the limit, and the stock market was booming. Times were great. There seemed to be no end in sight. It was the time of great revolt in almost everything, in dress, and morals, and manners. And um, Fitzgerald, of course, was tucked away right in the middle of it. It presents a picture of the 1920s as an endless party, as one long drunken revel. The greatest party description in all of English language literature is Gatsby's party. That's the party. No other writer can ever write a party scene again because Fitzgerald's done it. There was music from my neighbor's house through the summer nights. In his blue gardens, men and girls came and went like moths among the whisperings and the champagne and the stars. The orchestra is playing yellow cocktail music, and the opera of voices pitches a key higher until the air is alive with chatter and laughter and casual innuendo and introductions forgotten on the spot and enthusiastic meetings between women who never knew each other's names. The Great Gatsby it does better in boom times like the present. And it's impressive testimony to the scratch on the American mind this book has made, that when there appears to be a great deal of mindless hedonism and easy money, people think about Gatsby. When The Great Gatsby was published, Fitzgerald was already famous. The success of his first novel, This Side of Paradise, had made him a celebrity at the age of 23. Like his new hero, the self-made Gatsby, Fitzgerald believed all his dreams of romance, riches and happiness could come true. I think Fitzgerald picked a good moment to come here uh, to New York. The times and the, and the boy were, were right for each other, at least for a, for a brief moment. He was aware of the sort of infinite possibilities of, of uh, the city, uh, and he was attuned to the, to the myth of it. Over the Great Bridge, with the sunlight through the girders making a constant flicker upon moving cars, with the city rising up across the river in white heaps and sugar lumps all built with a wish out of non-olfactory money. The city seen from the Queensboro Bridge is always the city seen for the first time, in its first wild promise of all the mystery and beauty in the world. Anything can happen now that we've slid over this bridge. Anything at all. Even Gatsby could happen. Fitzgerald loved New York. He said New York has all the iridescence of the beginning of the world. It was the place where anything was possible. It was the place where the realization of the American dream might take place. 
we are sprung from um, a crabby, bitter old pilgrims who didn't get it right in Europe and came over here and tried to get it right a second time. It's a culture that really believes that if you're talented and good looking and have energy and ambition, that you can do any goddamn thing you want to do. Gatsby and Fitzgerald had in common the belief of the possibilities of American life. More than that, the capacity, the power of any American to remake himself. You can be whatever your determination, your dream, your belief, your conviction. People don't consider it bogus in this culture to reinvent yourself, to start again, to get a new identity. In fact, it's rather expected of you. And uh, certainly Fitzgerald was able uh, to reinvent himself many times. And the point of Gatsby is exactly that he is an invention, a construct, a fable. Look here, old sport. I don't want you to get the wrong idea about me from all these stories you hear. Now, I'm going to tell you God's truth. I was born to wealthy parents in the Middle West, both dead. I was educated at Oxford because all my ancestors were educated there. After that, I lived like a young Raja in all the capitals of Europe, you know, painting a little, things for myself only. I'm trying to forget something very sad that happened to me long ago. <laughs> Fitzgerald makes Gatsby's mysterious origins an essential part of his attraction. Even the name is assumed. James Gatz is reborn as Jay Gatsby. Jay Gatsby has to reject his past, this pathetic father, this Midwest family, and he has to give up James Gatz and become something completely new and self-invented. An important connection between Gatsby and Fitzgerald is the way both men reinvented themselves. It's, most people don't know the extent to which Fitzgerald made himself into uh, the kind of person that he thought would be uh, what people wanted. There's a great deal of F. Scott Fitzgerald and Jay Gatsby. Uh, both were from the Midwest, both came east, both reinvented themselves again and again. Uh, here, for instance, you can see in the record of Fitzgerald's autographs uh, the way his handwriting reflects his reinvention of himself, even his very name. Uh, he changes from Scott to Scott Fitzgerald to F. Scott Fitzgerald. Like Gatsby, Fitzgerald's background was not all he would have wished. He was the son of a failed businessman from St. Paul, Minnesota, a small Midwestern city. The family lived in a prosperous part of town, but in a rented apartment. The family was supported by the mother's family's money. And Fitzgerald grew up on the periphery of beautiful homes and, as he saw it, beautiful people, people whose lives were filled with possibility. And he walked along the streets of St. Paul and looked in through lighted windows and saw these people in their finery, what seemed to him finery, and saw them in brightly lit rooms, and they seemed so graceful to him compared to his own dreary family. He was anxious to escape from St. Paul. Every train that left St. Paul was a train that Fitzgerald dreamed of being on. The death of a rich aunt enabled Fitzgerald to attend Princeton University. He called it the pleasantest country club in America. 
I think Scott's sense of being an outsider was with him his entire life. It, it definitely followed him to Princeton, where he discovered he was a Catholic amongst Protestants and um, that he was from a sort of backwater as far as the East Coast was concerned. That he wasn't accepted as a football player was a devastation to him because that was a way to prestige and glory on campus. He did want glory in, in one form or another, so he had to keep revising his dreams. Fitzgerald's chief study at Princeton was the social system here. And though he didn't have the kind of family and money backing him up that would have sent him to the top, he did have good looks and charm and talent, and he made the most of them. In many ways, Fitzgerald was money-driven. He was fascinated by rich people. He hung out with rich people. He was like a moth drawn to a flame. It's a famous cliche. The, one, the, the famous line he made to Ernest Hemingway, the, ri the rich are different from you and me, he said to Hemingway. And Hemingway said, yes, they have more money. Uh, but I mean, the point is that in that interchange uh, on Fitzgerald's part, there is an enormous uh, adulation, if you will, for the idea of accumulating money. Oh, it's wonderful to see you like this, Jay, all successful and everything. It's wonderful to see you, Daisy, here, in my own home. That's all it needs to make it perfect, the way I've always imagined it. In here is my gallery, all genuine old masterpieces. At the heart of the novel is the fact that Gatsby and Daisy have loved before but the relationship failed because of his lack of money. What makes Jay Gatsby noble in the eyes of Fitzgerald is that the money and the mansion and the parties and the silk shirts uh, were really a function of, of, of a kind of romantic dream. He became rich for Daisy. He made himself into what he imagined to be a romantic figure, to be the archetype of American success uh, for love. I think both Fitzgerald and Gatsby wanted to be successful, meaning to be loved, and it's impossible to separate um, a filthy lucre from a pure uh, erotic adulation. Uh, when Daisy's voice is compared to the sound of money, we have the complete equation that beauty is social standing, is exquisite trust funds, is unlimited security for the rest of your life. So to fall in love with the boss's daughter is to understand American society completely. Why didn't you wait for me? Because rich girls don't marry poor boys, Jay Gatsby. Haven't you heard? Rich girls don't marry poor boys. <laughs> Fitzgerald's Daisy was Zelda Sayer, a celebrated Southern Belle from Montgomery, Alabama. Fitzgerald found Zelda's aura of money, beauty and social position irresistible and fell deeply in love. When Zelda broke off the engagement in 1919, she was worried that Scott would not be an adequate provider. Um, the South was very poor, and, and all women were trained then to make sure they married well. It was really the only avenue that you had to um, survive. And the advice she was getting at home was, don't marry him. Then he had a great miracle in his life. 
and in a fury of discipline and industry, he rewrites a very clumsy novel, and it is accepted miraculously by a very prestigious publisher. He goes to New York. He now wins the girl. Zelda joins him. They marry in St. Patrick's Cathedral. And he is now the toast of New York City. They came east where all the power was, where all the magazines were printed. They found a way to get into those magazines based on their beauty and their brilliance, and somehow contrived to become, by dint of sheer ambition and talent and moxie and pure nerve, the Adam and Eve of modern celebrity culture. When you realize how many thousands of photographs were taken of these kids in their 20s, you have to look to uh, Kate Moss and contemporary Madonna, contemporary figures to find equivalents. Money and success had played a critical part in winning Zelda. Money and success had undone the failure of history. Fitzgerald, uh, in his own life, was able to make uh, the love story come true. But Gatsby's tragedy, Gatsby's doom, is he confuses romantic love with money. And he thinks that the money will buy the girl, and this is a girl uh, who's tougher than he is, harder than he is, and who understands more about money than he ever will. Poor Gatsby thinks all money is equal. She knows that Buchanan money is better than Gatsby money. Uh, Gatsby is naive and innocent. What's the most memorable thing Gatsby says in the novel? Can't repeat the past? Why, of course you can. How do you repeat the past? With money. I've got a man in London who buys all my clothes. He sends over a selection of things at the beginning of each season. Spring and fall. One of the most telling scenes in the book is that marvelous moment when Gatsby reveals to Daisy his absolute credential which means that he has a Bond Street tailor who has made the most beautiful shirts in the world. Oh. I've never seen such beautiful shirts before. Daisy's sadness at the sight of these shirts, I think, is a kind of sort of reverberating factor in our own consumer lives in which we imagine that if we can only get this particular table for our apartment or this particular gorgeous stainless steel lamp that everything will fall into place for us. You have to get past the plot of The Great Gatsby. And as you get deeper into the book, you see that Fitzgerald had very profound things to say about money, its effect on people's behavior, its effect on a whole culture and the whole striving in American life for social status and position and all that glamour that looks initially so appealing. You can read the book in the end perfectly validly in one of two ways, and they're totally antithetical to one another. The surface story is uh, simply the surface of uh, the roaring 20s in the United States. You know, a good time is being had by all the parties go on all day and all night. A stronger reading is as a kind of uh, almost meaningless dance of death, the dancing that is going on. We're gonna have a party. Cheers. People think, oh, it's easy, and it's about the jazz age, it's about the parties, and that's the surface. But what they all have in common is violence Daisy. or disaster. Daisy, Daisy! I'll say it any time I want! I'm sorry, Myrtle. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. <laughs> yes, you did. Along with Silas Marner, it's probably taught as much as any other book in American public schools. And yet, when you really know what the book is about, which is about 
immense erotic longing about doing anything for money, about how absolute power corrupts absolutely, and about how getting what you want is often the end of you. It's a pretty subversive and dicey text to be putting in the hands of 13-year-olds. The shock of The Great Gatsby is just how short a distance it is between love and hate, happiness and desolation, sobriety and oblivion. Fitzgerald had a much darker vision than I think is, is commonly realized, um, um, uh, an almost existential vision. You know, it is the, what he described as the foul dust that floated in Gatsby's wake, which ultimately is hanging in the air. His was a tragic sensibility. The tempo of the city had changed sharply. The uncertainties of 1920 were drowned in a steady golden roar, and many of our friends had grown wealthy. But the restlessness of New York approached hysteria. The parties were bigger, the shows were broader, the buildings were higher, morals were looser, and the liquor was cheaper. But all these did not really minister much delight. Young people wore out early. They were hard and languid at 21, and none of them contributed anything new. Most of my friends drank too much. The more they were in tune with the times, the more they drank. All of Fitzgerald's friends remarked at the way the two of them were living. They became more and more frantic. And their exploits were reported throughout the newspapers, uh, jumping into fountains, uh, taking wild rides down New York City. It became a kind of frenzy or a kind of hysteria, which was like the hysteria that was going on in the country at the time. Every major American writer of the first half of the 20th century, with very rare exceptions, was a serious drinker, a hard drinker. Whether the alcohol, whether the drinking fuel they're writing, we don't know. It's a truth, it's a circumstance, it's a fact that American writers at a certain time uh, were all serious drinkers. Uh, Fitzgerald's reputation, Fitzgerald's career, his name, uh, if he's the Prince Charming of American literature, he's the drunken Prince Charming of America. He's the great American drunk. Fitzgerald's closest friend during the 1920s was arguably Ernest Hemingway. And Hemingway is the man who came up with the famous phrase that good writers are drinking writers and drinking writers are good writers. Evidence for the view that Fitzgerald was self-destructive is not hard to come by. Evidence for the view that he was consciously so, and that this is revealed by him to us and to himself in his writing, wouldn't be that hard to come by either. Um, for example, um, here's a, just a little passage in the book. I just remember that today's my birthday. I was 30. Before me stretched the portentous, menacing road of a new decade. 30, the promise of a decade of loneliness a thinning list of single men to know, a thinning briefcase of enthusiasm, thinning hair. This is a guy who really thinks it's all over from now on, it's downhill all the way, it's burnout, hemorrhoids, impotence, the lot is coming. And he thinks, well, I don't have to go through with it. I can flame out, I'll skip that bit, I'll cheat it. Um, and the cheating takes the form of excess. You were constantly drunk. You didn't work and were dragged home at night by taxi drivers when you came home at all. You got up for lunch. You made no advances towards me and complained I was unresponsive. You were literally eternally drunk for the whole summer. All the time I Scott was really getting drunker and coming apart, I felt a, a tremendous, I felt a tremendous uh, sympathy for him. I, I, I really, I mean, he, he sort of made me cry, really, and I, 
You know, I wanted to hug him. I wanted to help him. I became aware of how much he was drinking after a while when I came up to the house. And there was an actor who owned the property. And he was snooping around the barrels, the trash barrels, when I came in. Uh, and made some comment about the drink, about the bottles. And I went in and told Fitzgerald as a kind of joke, but Fitzgerald got very annoyed at this and said, look, we have to get rid of these bottles. I would say he could, uh, he could do two pints of gin a day, say, easily. At one time, in order not to drink what he called hard spirits, he would drink 30 bottles of beer in a day, which is a lot of alcohol, you know? <laughs> in other words, there were periods in his life of where if he wasn't in a hospital, he was drunk. Drunk or hospital, either one or the other. Now, that's the ruinous period, I mean, where his agent couldn't sell his stories, and he was getting close to destitution. Yeah, when you're a happy alcoholic, it's different from being a desperate, suicidal alcoholic. I don't think that's much fun. And, uh, yeah, what destroyed him was failure. He was flirting with disaster at all times. There's no doubt about it. And in fact, he was um, headed for a long slide downward. And I think um, the character of, of, of Gatsby is a kind of uh, uh, image of this. You sense doom in Gatsby because Fitzgerald sensed doom in himself. Daisy doesn't love you. She's never loved you. She loves me. You must be crazy. The only reason she married you was because I was too poor and she was tired of waiting. It was a terrible mistake. But in her heart, she never loved anyone except me. Oh, you want too much? I love you now, isn't that enough? I can't help what's past. I did love him once, but I loved you too. Gatsby and Fitzgerald were sacrificed to the very thing they most wanted. This is the other side of this great um, lust for success. By courting absolute love, absolute money, you set yourself up for the disaster of failure. And the book becomes a kind of prophecy in relation to lived life and to the tragedy of his own burnout. And the prophetic nature of the book was to resonate more and more as Fitzgerald and Zelda's lives unraveled and the end of the decade approached. The bubble burst from my grandparents. Um, pretty dramatically in 1929 when Zelda had her first nervous breakdown. And the correspondence between my grandparents in this difficult time is heartbreaking. Um, dearest and always dearest Scott, I'm sorry that there should be nothing to greet you but an empty shell. I love you anyway, even if there isn't any me or any love or even any life. I love you. Zelda's collapse really marked the end of an era, and it was timed precisely to the collapse of the stock market in America. We were somewhere in North Africa when we heard a dull, distant crash, which echoed to the farthest wastes of the desert. What was that? It was nothing. And do you think we ought to go home and see? No, it was nothing. In some ways, The Great Gatsby is parallel to what was going on in the jazz age, this incredible sense of energy and moving forward and Gatsby realizing everything. And then it explodes and crashes, and everything in that moment we know is lost. The road is littered with bodies by the end of the book. Everybody who doesn't have major money is a casualty. As time goes on, I think we all realize that it was a kind of prophecy. 
it winds up telling us what we can expect and what we should fear. And what it predicts and what it warns us against is precisely this moment. We're going through a period right now which is not unlike the 1920s. Huge wealth, a lot of new wealth. A lot of people become millionaires in very, I would guess, Gatsby-like ways. What well, we heard a lot of in the 80s about how much the 80s resembled the 20s, the excess and the greed and the Dionysian behavior of these two periods being so similar. Well, here we are in the year 2000, and the wealth um, that I see around me is, is, is staggering. Uh, there was nothing like it in the 80s. It's an extraordinary uh, moment right now, and one that um, I think would be somewhat recognizable to Fitzgerald. As we go into the 21st century, America is plainly on the march toward a, a, trying to accumulate everything uh, that can be accumulated. There's an almost mystical need to celebrate uh, wealth as a value in itself. Uh, and that, to that degree, uh, it's very Gatsby-esque. But behind all of this, I think, is something unspoken, namely that there is an ominous cloud on the horizon in history, no bubble has ever lasted forever. It didn't in the 1920s, in, in Fitzgerald's time. It's certainly not going to do it again. Yeah, there was a special light to it. Uh, part of the light was knowing that it was very temporal. You know, it was good while it lasted, very special. That's sort of what the 20s was for a lot of people in this country. And they had a hard time adjusting to the 30s. <laughs> Just like a lot of people are going to have a hard time adjusting to uh, when it happens here. Oh, boy. When it cracks here, it'll be like the Titanic sinking. You know, the unsinkable ship. Where is the iceberg? Shells a warning, I think. He's an admonition. He's back to at the feast. He's the, the moving finger at the banquet, tracing a couple of stray thoughts on the wall to the effect, you know, there will be a terrible hangover to come after all this indulgence and excess and, and selfishness. And I think he's one of the, he's one of the uh, small but persistent voices that people hear in their heads at times when th things appear to be mindless. There's a Gatsby every 15 minutes in the electronic computer world. People are making fortunes that make Gatsby's wealth look like nickels and dimes. Gatsby has become a kind of quintessential American character. People who have never read The Great Gatsby, people who've never read a book, people who've never heard of F. Scott Fitzgerald, refer to somebody, oh, he's like Gatsby. He's a kind of Gatsby. Over the library rotunda of his $100 million house, Bill Gates quotes Gatsby, he had come a long way to this blue lawn, that, that wonderful line near the end. 
how is it that somebody like Bill Gates associates himself with Gatsby? Well, in some way, that tells us that Fitzgerald has really tapped in to this American dream. Well, we're currently having one of our usual ghastly four-year runs at the presidency in this country. And uh, most of the candidates seem to be characters out of the great Gatsby. They express the values of Tom Buchanan. They wish to make the rich richer and the poor poorer in the great American tradition. I mean, they don't quite say so, but that's what they mean when they talk about this enormous tax cut. But the, the rhetoric spoken by George W. Bush and Al Gore also is very much the rhetoric of the great Gatsby. It is the notion that uh, each and every American will see all of their dreams and desires realized. Well, the American dream and the great Gatsby just leads to self-destruction. The book is loss. It's, it's, it's a vision of loss, not of gain. They were careless people, Tom and Daisy. They smashed up things and creatures and then retreated back into their money or their vast carelessness or whatever it was that kept them together and let other people clean up the mess they had made. The American dream is pretty candidly and cynically negated uh, by the Great Gatsby. It's a remarkable thing that the book has become canonical in a society that perhaps by doing this demonstrates that it's not completely sure of the validity of its founding illusion. It's a quadruple negation of the whole American idea of the happy ending and of there at least being some uplift in the final frames. There's absolutely none of that. It's a dying fall. Fitzgerald had the understanding to view a swimming pool as something not just to swim in, but to drown in, at a moment when pools were novelties. And that is in some ways a kind of emblem of the 20th century, uh, when recreation becomes poisonous, when idleness becomes a full-time job, becomes a, a, a sort of step towards suicide. As Nick surveys the wreckage and as he sees the damage that's done, some kind of moral vision begins to kick in, which finally drives him away from the scene once Gatsby's gone, and, and finally entitles him to that beautiful last page of the book in which he is able to imagine America as seen from the prow of the first ship to discover it. It's a vision of paradise. It's a vision of absolute innocence. It's a vision of the landscape before mankind found a trillion ways to corrupt it. As the moon rose higher, the inessential houses began to melt away until gradually I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes a fresh green breast of the new world. For a transitory enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, face to face for the last time in history with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. I'm still trying to figure out what, what is at the heart of the great Gatsby. I don't think of it as a dark book, although dark things happen. There is a nobility to the tragedy that justifies the life of, of the hero. He had a longing for something that was absolutely pure. He comes outside leaving his party behind and all of the music and the dancers and all of his wealth and walks out through the twilight 
out to his dock with the green light at the end, and he looks out across the water towards the house where he knows that his unattainable love is Daisy Buchanan. That's the feeling of the novel. We yearn for uh, something that we cannot have. Fitzgerald's mystical green light endlessly perplexes and intrigues, intangible to the last, but at the same time, full of meaning. I think everybody has a green light that they see across the channel and can't quite get to. I mean, for everybody watching, there will be another answer. I don't know if it's uh, the wish for absolute fame, the wish for the ultimate erotic experience, the wish for stocks and bonds enough to cause your children and grandchildren to live happily ever after. You fill in the blank, and it's inevitably uh, a channel away. It's always on the other shore. And uh, it's one of the things that makes the novel so beautiful. It's, it's so full of longing, and it's so full of impossible longing, but that's what longing is. We're all uh, on the road uh, to tragedy, to failure, to death, uh, and what Fitzgerald and other romantics say is perform all the miracles you can while you can. Fulfill all the possibilities. Drink the best wines. Eat the best meals. Make love to the most beautiful, exciting women while you can. Because in the grave, you don't get to do any of these things. All great writers are in revolt against death. All great writers are writing about death, no matter what else they're writing about. And what the romantic says is, do it while you can. Make it better through will, through determination. Make it better than it otherwise be. Anyone who thinks of Gatsby as a romance is missing its point. One essential thing, I think, is the sense of pointlessness. A pervasive sense of pointlessness amounting almost to nihilism. And that is, that is a thought that leads you know, to despair, almost to suicide. Um, and it's ever present in the book. At all, at all times, people are basically asking, what are we doing here? What is the point? What's the meaning of this? Fitzgerald is um, the American Camus. That's not romance. That's modernism. And of a pretty pitiless kind. It's a great cure for romance, The Great Gatsby. Lovers do not give each other copies of The Great Gatsby. Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgastic future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out our arms further, and one fine morning, so we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Every story taken to the end has the same end, and we all know what the end is. But the end does not diminish us. The end does not make it less necessary to keep um, rowing our boats against the, against the current, which will, in the end, claim all of us. We are all uh, Gatsby's. We are all rowing against the current, and we never give up. was the last in the current series of Omnibus. It returns to BBC One in the autumn.